So great, we're going to get started. Um, so it's Francis, right, Sharice, and myself in the room. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us on, on this webinar for sustainability. Um, so as always, just make sure your line is muted if you're not speaking. Uh, use the chat box, and I will be recording the webinar and sending uh, the link to you uh, either today or tomorrow. Um, so if you do miss anything or want to review it again, that's available. And also, if you want to share anything on social media, you can just use the hashtag sustainability and tag Build Inspire and Cole 4 d Great, so I'm going to pass it over to Francis uh, to do an introduction of our speaker. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, to our first webinar for 2018, uh, where the title of the webinar is Environmental Sustainability and Education. And we have our speaker this morning right here from British Columbia in um, Abbotsford, uh, Jennifer Long, Chilliwack. Jennifer, you have to correct me when you speak. Uh, Jennifer is a school teacher in Chilliwack, and uh, she is well traveled. Uh, and the basis of the travel is mostly to explore the globe as I can see it. Um, she has, to, has had the opportunity to share uh, this exploration of her with the students by arranging a variety of global excursions for them to various countries, including Mexico and China. And uh, as you witness the personal growth of the students, uh, because of all of this, she decided in 2010 to take a two-year leave of absence. And at that time, she went to Costa Rica, where she worked for a very small nonprofit environmental school in the Cloud Forest. Of Monteverde. And uh, during this time, she could put the theory into practice where she could put all the concepts that she learned at university and came across in books, she could really put it into practice while working there. And she also had the experience to develop lessons uh, rooted in the environment. When she came back from there, she was, um, she had a renewed passion and she was inspired. Uh, for biology, she was at a renewed passion for biology, and uh, she was inspired and in having a, a broader cultural awareness. Um, and she decided to channel all of that into creating an ecotourism and environmental biology course. Um, but Jennifer, in 2014, was selected as one of the 25 National Geographic Grosvenor Fellows. Uh, the National, the Grosvena Teacher Fellow Program is a professional development opportunity for free K-12 educators or teachers as we know them in many countries or refer to them. And uh, this was made possible by a partnership uh, through the Lindbad Expeditions and also the National Geographic Society. And those of you who are watching uh, those channels would be very much you know envious of, of this woman who had this brilliant opportunity but this opportunity didn't come just like that she worked very hard to be selected as one of the 25. they referred to them as exemplary educators um, and then they have to complete a series of deliverables and that enable them to transfer those experiences into new ways to teach students and engage colleagues and through this experience, they bring new geographic awareness into the learning environments and communities. So you will agree with me that Jennifer, with all of this experience, is the perfect person to speak to us today as an educator um, on how we can bring environmental sustainability together with education, whether it is formal education or non-formal education, whether it is just education or just learning. Through this process, um, she's coming from a very practical perspective. I think that will also help us. Um, and we are all very excited, Jennifer, to, to listen to your presentation. 
So without further ado, I will give the mic back to Christina, uh, who will now ask Jennifer uh, to speak. And I just saw her picture coming up on the screen. Good morning, Jennifer. Welcome. Good morning. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you and welcome everyone to the uh, webinar today on environmental sustainability and education. Um, I was originally supposed to do this webinar back in November uh, and unfortunately had a family emergency and so had to cancel last minute. Um, but I know that many of you sent well wishes and thoughts and prayers and so I really appreciate that and appreciate everybody's understanding uh, that, you know, in terms of rescheduling and everything. So, and that's actually a really great segue into my first uh, slide. So I'm going to turn off the camera right here so I'm not a distraction and Christine I'll get you to switch to that first slide perfect uh, so the first slide um, basically I just wanted to sort of go over who I am and and also who I'm uh, what I'm not um, so I'm a, an aunt a sister a daughter and a friend and uh, I'm an outdoor lover and traveler uh, those two things have really for me driven a lot of my my choices and um, you know, my, uh, my education practice in life, as you'll see through today's presentation. Um, and that's also led me to become an ecotourism and biology teacher in Chilliwack, British Columbia. What I am not uh, is an expert in this field by any means. I feel like there's a lot of people who know, know a lot more than I do, uh, but I still think it's important to share what I've learned and, and the practice that I have. And uh, I'm not an expert in each of your countries and their varying unique uh, and unique needs. Um, and for me, the average North American spends less than 10% of their life outside. Uh, so the challenges that I face when I'm engaging students in environmental sustainability are going to be very different than the challenges faced by students in other countries who are living in floodplains or temporary settlements for migrant workers and, and such. Um, so my goal for this presentation is not to tell you what you should or shouldn't be doing. Uh, it's to provide you with one perspective, my perspective uh, of sustainability and show you how it's defined my particular teaching practice. By the end of this uh, presentation, I hope there is something that you can take away and use towards your own sustainable development goals, or maybe this presentation is just a, a stimulus to start a conversation uh, within your, your own organizational area. So in terms of the, the presentation, the, the general sort of overview of it, um, I'll start off by defining sustainability and just talking a little bit about what some of the views on, on sustainability are um, and also why it's important to talk about sustainability um, and then how culture ties into that. Um, from there, I'll sort of shift into my own journey um, and elaborate a little bit on what Francis was talking about in terms of my, you know, experiences in British Columbia, um, international travel with students, um, my two years spent in Costa Rica, uh, and then, of course, the National Geographic um, Grosvenor Fellowship uh, to Antarctica, um, and how that sort of allowed me to, to create this ecotourism course that I now teach. Um, from there, I'll just touch a little bit on the UN International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development um, and some of their suggestions for the way forward. And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end uh, to share a little bit and uh, I'll field any questions that you guys might have. So in terms of uh, defining sustainability, um, when we define sustainability or sustainable development, the definition that most people are familiar with is the one from the Brundtland Report um, of 1987. And that's the one that says sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of, the of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, I personally oftentimes use this particular definition in my classroom. Um, and while it's widely accepted as correct, um, it's definitely not without its critics. There are many people who claim that it's uh, more inspirational than practical. Others say that uh, it is not precise and measurable. Um, and that, that there's too much room for interpretation and so there's disagreement on what those uh, future needs might actually be. But probably the most notable critique is that it deals with the issues surrounding social, environmental and econo economy separately, failing to recognize or acknowledge the interconnectedness of those things. Um, the bottom picture uh, shows the, the three pillars of sustainability model. Uh, it's a powerful tool for defining the complete sustainability problem. Under this model, if any one pillar, so social, environmental, or economic, uh, is weak, the system as a whole is uh, unstable. 
Therefore, it's been suggested that any discussion of sustainability should broach not just the topic of environmental sustainability, but social and economical sustainability as well. I think many of you would likely agree that a conversation on how to be more environmentally friendly or environmentally sustainable in your specific communities would be a mute point if you're not also considering the changes on how those changes would affect potential for earning uh, a living in your community or how resources may be used in traditional ceremonies, etc. Yet even this model is not without critics who suggest that the three pillar model is too simplistic and that sustainability instead needs a more complex model that involves systems level thinking. Next slide. Um, so Peter Senge describes systems thinking as a way of thinking about the forces um, and interrelationships that shape the behavior of systems in order to help us see how to change systems more effectively and to act more in tune with natural processes of the natural and economic worlds. In other words, it's important to see the world as a collection of interconnected systems. Uh, in the first diagram on the left, environment and economic systems are still given equal weight, but we now see the interaction between those systems. The point where all three systems overlap is a place in which we'll find sustainability of the system as a whole. In the second diagram on the right-hand side, uh, the largest system is biosphere, in the biosphere in which we live. So environment is given the most important sort of spot. Within that framework lies the two human systems, the social and economic. This model shows that environmental sustainability must have the highest priority because it provides the ultimate constraints. The lower the carrying capacity of the environment, the lower the common good that can be delivered by the social system, and the less output the economic system can produce. In other words, if the environment in which we live becomes more and more degraded, that in turn is gonna put increased pressure on social and economic systems um, as areas run out of resources. And as we are definitely aware, this is already a reality in many places around the world. And that brings us to the second topic. Why is a conversation about sustainability important? It should go without saying that sustainability and the ability to meet, uh, meet future needs is a topic that should be central to every human being on this planet. The United Nations Environment Program warns that there's a very short time left, little more than a decade, within which to achieve environmental sustainability before entering a state of physical and economic decline, which means that every single one of us is going to be impacted by the choices made by organizations, people, and governments at this very moment. In his report, Uzel emphasizes the concept of sustainable development as being one of the most important ideas of the 21st century, or 20th century, since it's around this concept that our common future turns. He continues on to say it demands that all citizens in general, but more particularly those in positions of political power, assume the responsibility for global environmental change. Like other monumental historic problems, solutions exist for the sustainability problem. However, this will take identifying the root of the problem and starting there rather than trying to address one pillar at a time. Another thing to be considered at this point is the fact that globalization means that we've reached a point where global environmental problems are more serious than those that take place lower down on the spatial scale. Choices of, uh, being made on one side of the world are having profound effects on communities the world over. And in many cases, it's the developing countries that are being impacted the most. That's not to say that we can't tackle the problem at the local and global level, but certainly those of us that are living in nations that are causing dispropor disproportionately large effects are the ones who need to be doing the line share, the work, uh, and the change. I get you to flip to the next slide, Christina. Perfect. So another layer of the sustainability conversation um, is the role that culture plays in environment and sustainability. If we agree that the key components of the sustainability discussion include environment, uh, economics, and social, culture must then be a key aspect of the social subsystem. It plays an inescapable and central role in all aspects of human behavior, in cognition, in preference and in the meaning we place on things. Culture itself evolved alongside humans and thus influences how we use resources and the value we place on our surroundings. 
different aspects of the environment become salient to different groups. Their preferences vary um, on the basis of the different evaluations of environment quality based on differing values, ideals, and images. Another way of phrasing this is the explanation given by Chin Chin Kao and Terry Purcell. Pro-environment attitudes and behaviors cannot be understood and sustained on a global level without a close link uh, to the system of social values, which are in turn determined by the cultures in which they're rooted. So culture impacts the environmental sustainability um, at a few different levels. Uh, firstly, through its uh, intrinsic link between cultural diversity and biodiversity, of the particular area, through its influence uh, on consumption patterns, and through its contribution to sustainable development uh, or sustainable environmental management practices uh, as a result of local and traditional knowledge. The close ties between culture and environment and the potential for culture to act as a driver uh, and enabler of sustainable development is one that's been recognized by interna the international community. Um, as outlined in the UN Systems Task Team on the post-2015 UN Development Agenda. They found that culture can be the driver for development within community-wide social, economical, and environmental impacts. Cultural heritage, cultural creative industry, and creative industries, sustainable cultural tourism, and cultural infrastructure can serve as strategic tools for revenue generation, um, particularly in developing countries, given their often rich cultural heritage and substantial labor force. We're going to come back to this idea of culture um, as a powerful driver in a little bit, but for the time being, I wanted to segue into how my own beliefs surrounding culture and environmental sustainable uh, sustainability have been shaped over the years. While my journey to understanding um, issues of sustainability did not start with this particular question, uh, in the last couple of years, I have come to understand the question of the, what role educators play in preparing students to be global citizens and environmental stewards. Um, and I've only come to realize recently um, how central it's been to me all along. I did first stumble upon this question in 2013 when I was completing an application for the National and Geographic Grosvenor Fellowship, which I will definitely explain a little bit more about uh, later. In having to write an essay response to this question, I was forced to pause and reflect on my values and how they had informed my practice uh, up until that point. And it's this journey that I'm going to share with you over the next few slides. For me, environmental conscience started at a very young age. Uh, and so that's a picture of me enjoying the environment. Um, at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, Baba Diyum um, made the well-known statement, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. And for me, this has definitely been a, a driving um, sort of statement, uh, one that I've come back to many times throughout my, my career and, and my life in general. So I grew up in a family that valued the outdoors and spent a lot of time in nature. At two months old, my father would strap me into a sled and take me cross country skiing for, for hours at a time. Uh, we hiked, we cycled, we canoed, we camped, uh, and generally I grew up being taught to love outdoor pursuits. While as a child I may have complained when my father told me for the 15th time on that hike that our destination was just around the next corner, um, I have no doubt that all this time um, spent in nature is what really shaped me into the person that I am today. And while I was very fortunate to have a family that instilled a, a value of respect for the environment in me, I was also very aware that the same was not true for many of my friends. As I got older, I became more and more aware that our family was not the norm. Uh, and that many of my friends hadn't had the same exposure to the outdoors. I had to ask the question, if not from their families, then where would they learn to love the environment? The environmental experiences that started for me at a young age lay the groundwork and helped shape my beliefs of the role that educators play in fostering environmental stewards. When I eventually followed in the footsteps of my father in pursuit of career in education as a high school biology teacher, helping students to understand their environment was a primary focus. Family and school are two of the contexts in which children can become real promoters of the attitudinal and behavior changes that must be spread to all levels of community if we want to foster an environmental ethic of sustainability and conservation. 
and I'll switch to the next slide there, yeah. Well, the environmental stewardship piece started at a young age for me. Uh, the global citizenship, citizenship piece did not come until I had started my teaching career. In my second year of teaching, I was given the opportunity to organize a student trip to build houses in Mexico. 28 students and five adults spent eight days framing, roofing, stuccoing, and painting, while at the same time playing with the children in the neighborhood and getting to know the family that we were building for. The day we handed over the keys to the house to the, uh, of the house to the family, I knew that their lives weren't the only ones that had been changed in that week. I was able to watch these students uh, transformed, uh, transform as they learned about another culture and began to understand and appreciate a way of life that was different from their own. By the last day and an emotional farewell, these students had formed bonds with these families. Many of those bonds have continued on to this very day. I've had a number of these students who have actually returned uh, to visit those families. They've continued fundraising and they've even gone back to build more houses uh, in the past few years. I'll never forget the words that one of those students um, had said to me at the end of the trip. Why is it that they have so little and are so happy while we have so much and are so unhappy? I truly believe that this is a level of understanding and awareness uh, that can only come from immersion in these type of experiences for these students. And again, it brings me back to that quote uh, by Duyum, in the end, we'll conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we're taught. I believe that it's especially important for those of us living in developed nations to ensure that we are teaching our students about other cultures and other ways of living to help build an understanding and a passion which will lead to a desire to help preserve cultural diversity. I did take two more groups of uh, students to Mexico uh, to build houses before shifting my uh, focus and taking groups of students to China. Uh, the first year was uh, a cultural exchange, but in the second year, we traveled to southern China to Huanshan in order to volunteer in an elementary school, teaching English lessons and participating in their daily routines. We observed the obvious or the structure imposed by their uh, classes and participated in uh, the manual labor lessons in the field behind the school. We observed the obvious poverty with 15 children squeezed into one small bedroom, their single change of clothes folded neatly at the ends of their beds. We observed with some level of guilt while we, they received a single egg and a bun for lunch while we were fed a full meal in another room. But at the same time, we also saw children who were smiling and having fun and who were appreciative of everything that they had. We saw teachers and staff who cared about their students' education and did everything they could with the resources that they had. I think that in the end, again, we learned just as much from them as they did from us. The students were again beginning to appreciate a way of life and a value system that was different than their own. And in my opinion, this is a big first step to becoming a global citizen. After a few years of teaching and leading international trips, I felt the need to do my own immersion experience, where I could focus more on my own personal growth and understanding of other cultures and other ways of life. And so this is why in 2010, I took a leave of absence from my job in Canada and moved to Monteverde, Costa Rica. Monteverde itself is a town of about 6,000 people, um, isolated on a mountaintop in Costa Rica. It takes about, uh, depending on whether it's rainy season or not, it takes about uh, four to six hours uh, in order to get up the mountain to this small little village. Um, and I found a job as a science teacher at the Monteverde Cloud Forest School. It's a small nonprofit school with about 75% of students receiving uh, either partial or full support for their tuition. 95% uh, of the students at the school uh, were local and about 5% of the school uh, were uh, students who'd come down with parents who were on sabbatical from um, universities in the States or in Canada. The school's goal was to graduate bilingual students with strong roots in environmentalism and it seemed to be ex the exact fit I was looking for. As a biology teacher, I was living my dream. The campus was 106 acres of cloud forest. My hallways became paths through the jungle. My classroom, a single room structure without phone lines or Wi-Fi. This was a huge shift from the conditions I was used to in Canada. In North America, it was all about using the latest and greatest technology to engage student learners. But here, the outdoors became my inspiration. It provided me with the opportunity to get outside of my classroom and create lessons and activities that were embedded in this environment that we were living in. Rather than relying on textbooks or videos on the internet to help students, uh, help teach students concepts, we would go outside and investigate the ecosystems around us. 
and, as I, and I was learning just as much from the students as they were from me. Many of them had grown up with parents who were guides at the local reserve, and therefore tree and insect names and identification uh, became, were, were second nature to them, and so I learned a lot of that from them. And speaking of insects, I also learned how to deal with a variety of different challenges that come from living in a cloud forest. Um, I had all sorts of insects, some of them dangerous, some of them not. Um, and I would often have students come to my classroom with the, the newest beetle or snake or whatever they had found. Um, and of course, then there was the rainy season um, and the torrential downpours that would last for 40 days at a time and the mold that would grow on absolutely every surface, um, you know, in both the, the classroom and my house. As I learned to deal with all the various different challenges uh, and became inspired by my surroundings, um, perhaps one of the most meaningful projects that I completed with these students was an investigation of a local watershed. In Costa Rica, gray water, and I'll go back to the last slide just for one last second. Yeah, perfect. Uh, in Costa Rica, gray water, um, which is basically everything except for sewage um, from homes, is allowed to be directly dumped into streams. So my grade 10 group was learning about watersheds and we decided that in addition to doing our regular water testing that we would hike the length of one of the streams in town. Um, it's called the Quebrada Sucia, which ironically means dirty stream. Um, so as we went, walked the stream, we uh, had a camera and a GPS in hand and every time we would find a grey water input, so one of those pipes you see in the, the right hand picture, um, we would basically drop a, a GPS waypoint as well as take a, a picture, a time uh, stamped picture of that particular um, grey water input. We then used the GPS waypoints and the photographs and put them together into a map of all the grey water inputs along um, the length of the stream. Um, so we uploaded this da uh, data and created an interactive map in which people could click on each of the different waypoints and up would come the picture. And so you're seeing a, a screenshot from that uh, interactive map there. Um, and basically we uh, created brochures to help the uh, inform the residents of the impact of dumping gray water into streams and ways they could minimize this overall impact. Uh, we presented the, um, the brochures and the interactive map to the city of Monteverde um, to help inform them. And then the final summative piece of this presentation um, was to present our work at the ECO4 conference in Heredia, Costa Rica, um, as well as via Skype to uh, students in the US who were involved in a worldwide Walden project. Um, so as you can see from the next picture, Perfect. Um, these kids were having fun in nature, um, but while they were having fun, they were also learning practical and real, real world skills. So this was an authentic, uh, you know, research project that actually informed the city um, and really helped the kids understand sort of their, their place uh, that they were living. So when I moved back to Canada after my two years in Costa Rica, I decided that I needed to continue incorporating the lessons I had learned in my classrooms uh, in Costa Rica uh, at home in the classrooms in Canada. I was offered the chance to create an environmental biology and ecotourism course, and of course I said yes. Through this course, I was able to take students hiking, camping, snowshoeing, and paddleboarding. We visited wetlands, identified plants, and we tested water parameters. As these students spent more and more time outdoors doing activities that they enjoyed and making emotional connections to, the, uh, to what they were exploring, it was an easy next step to initiate a discussion about the importance of conserving it. And again, it comes back to that quote by de Hume, in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. I continued organizing international student trips but this time trying to focus on trips that emphasize both environmental and cultural aspects. And I'll get you to switch the slide there. Um, there was two, more, uh, two years of taking Canadian students to volunteer at the Cloud Forest School in Costa Rica before shifting the focus to Peru, where we participated in a research project in the Pacaya Samiria Reserve. Let's flip the page to the next one. And over the course of the, the two weeks that we were there, um, students collected data about a, a wide variety of species. Their work was part of a bigger research project investigating the effects of climate change on the Amazon rainforest. They were also able to interact with the people in local villages to learn how climate change was impacting their traditional ways of life. These students were getting the bigger picture about how the decisions they were making at home in Canada were impacting people the world, the world over, people and species the world over. 
for me, providing opportunities for my students to connect with nature, uh, the natural and social world, is what is going to provide them with the motivation required to make the necessary changes um, to their life choices. And I'll get you to switch to the, the next picture. As this graphic shows, it's important that we provide them with a variety of lenses in which to provide their world, um, or sort of view their world, on a local, regional, and global level. The National Geographic Learning Framework creates, uh, seeks to create students who are curious, adventurous, responsible for others uh, and the natural world, and empowered and persistent in the face of uh, challenges. This past September I, September, I attended the World Environmental Education Con Congress, um, the aim of which was uh, one that really resonated with me. Uh, their aim was to promote active, informed, and responsible citizenship as a condition for a more peaceful, fair, an ecological human society, to guarantee an equitable, equitable access to natural resources and a harmonious relationship among human beings, other living beings, and the planet. So speaking of National Geographic, um, the final piece to my journey was, um, was recognizing that it's not just the students that we need to be connecting with the environment and other cultures, but teachers as well. If we want 21st century learners, we must also create 21st century teachers. And actually, I'll go back to that first picture <laughs> just for a moment longer. Thank you. Um, at the same time that I had been working to create uh, these various different opportunities for my students, I had inadvertently been creating those exact same opportunities for myself. While my student students were learning respect for other cultures, so was I. While my students were learning to stand up paddleboard and become passionate about uh, protecting the wadi, bodies of water on which they were doing it, so was I. Organizations like National Geographic and Limbad Expeditions have recognized the importance of teacher experience and have established programs such as the Grosvenor Teacher Fellowship um, for this reason. Each year they choose between 25 and 35 teachers from across North America to participate in expeditions to places like Iceland, Greenland, the Arctic Svalbard, the Galapagos Islands, and Antarctica. Their goal is that teachers go and gain first-hand experience that they can come back and share with their classrooms, professional networks, and communities. And we'll go to that next picture now. In 2014, I was fortunate to be chosen for one of these fellowships and was able to travel to Antarctica. Having the opportunity to work and learn alongside naturalists who were experts in everything from cetaceans to penguins to whales to glaciers was the opportunity of a lifetime. It has allowed me to infuse my lessons with a new level of passion and excitement. I'm able to create authentic real life activities using data that I collected, which in turn makes it more engaging for the students. One of my favorite things that I brought back from Antarctica was actually um, I had a, the opportunity to work alongside a naturalist to use a remote operated vehicle, uh, a submersible that went into areas where it was too deep for the dive team to go. And we collected data and footage, um, video footage that we uh, basically put together into about a, an eight minute video for my students um, in which they could see all the underwater life in that particular area along the Antarctic Peninsula. So to be able to show students a, a video that I helped to create, um, and it features a lot of the, the species um, that we study in Biology 11, uh, is a pretty unique and, and special opportunity. Well, and I'll flip to the next picture there. While it would be far too expensive to send an entire class to Antarctica, by sending a teacher there, it means that I am able to bring this remote and threatened continent to life for my students and thereby help them to create the emotional connections that will then in turn uh, foster a desire to protect uh, in them. After my expedition to Antarctica, I then traveled to Rapa Nui, better known as Easter Island. This was an especially poignant experience for me because I was able to witness firsthand um, an area where there had been a collapse of a culture and its subsequent revitalization through ecotourism. It's believed that there was a massive decline in the Rapa Nui culture because of over-exploitation of natural resources and the deforestation on the island. And at one point, their numbers dropped down to as low as 111, 111 uh, Rapa Nui people on the island. In the last 30 years, ecotourism has become the primary economic driver on the island and has allowed Rapa Nui people to reclaim their culture and language once again. This story is not unique to Rapa Nui. In fact, ecotourism is helping to provide economic stimulus while helping to protect environment and culture worldwide. With, this tourism in, with the tourism industry being one of the world's fastest growing economic sectors, 
Uh, with gross worldwide uh, tourism receipts growing an average of 7% uh, from 1998 to 2008. Um, and a 12% growth in, in the least developed countries for the same period, uh, ecotourism has uh, the potential to be a very big um, driver in, in many countries. Um, ecotourism itself has, has four main goals. Uh, first, and, and you know, obviously foremost in terms of the, the education of the traveler, uh, because that's what's gonna drive people to continue coming to, to those areas. So to educate the traveler, um, but probably more importantly, to provide uh, funds for ecological conservation, of that area uh, to benefit the uh, ec economic development and political empowerment of local communities and to foster respect for different cultures and human rights. And so in terms of my ecotourism course, those are the, the four main goals that we always focus on um, and come back to. But certainly this is a, a growing area in, in global economy. Um, the potential for tourism to be a driver for development within community wide social, economic and environmental with the community-wide social, economic, and environmental impacts is so great that in 2017, um, the UN named it the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. Um, of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, there are four particularly relevant um, ones for the, the Girl Inspire, Girls Inspire programs. Um, goal number five, uh, which is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and children. Goal eight, to promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth full and productive employment and decent work for all. Goal 12, to ensure a sustainable consumption and production patterns. And goal 14, to conserve uh, and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Cultural heritage, cultural and creative industries, sustainable cultural tourism, and cultural infrastructure can serve as strategic tools for revenue generation. And I'll flip to that next slide. Uh, particularly in developing countries, uh, given their often rich cultural uh, heritage and substantial labor force. I'll just flip to the, the next slide there, I think. Perfect. Um, with low entry barrier and limited capital investment requires, requirements, cultural-based tourism can be especially beneficial to women um, and girls. Um, and certainly in terms of when we're looking at the numbers, um, you know, cultural and creative industries represent one of the most rapidly expanding sectors in the global economy, with growth rate of 17.6% in the Middle East and 13.9% uh, in Africa. And flipping to the next slide, some of the other benefits of cultural-led uh, development um, include greater social inclusiveness and rootedness, resilience, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship for individuals and communities, use of local resources, skills, and knowledge, strengthening of the social capital of a community, influence lifestyles, individual behavior, consumption patterns, values related to environmental stewardship and interactions with the environment, local and indigenous knowledge systems and environmental management practices provide valuable insights and tools for tracking ecolog ecological challenges, prevent biodiversity loss, reduce land degradation, and mitigate effects of climate change. UN interagency projects have demonstrated the power of culture to respond to gender issues, to health and environmental concerns, and to challenges in the areas of education and livelihood. So as far as the way forward, um, as you consider your own specific development, uh, sustainable development goals for your own organizations, if you haven't already, you may want to consider including some of these recommendations from the UN system task team on how to build on culture's contribution to, this, to sustainable development. So things such as integrating culture into governance, uh, into the conception, measurement, and practice of development with a view of advancing inclusive, equitable, and sustainable development. Supporting sustainable cultural tourism, cultural and creative industries as a powerful economic subsector that generates decent employment, stimulates local development, and fosters entrepreneurship. Cultural-led economic development should take into account the protection of cultural assets that are often fragile and uh, constitute a unique and non-renewable capital. And things that capitalize on traditional knowledge to foster environmental sustainability. So with this, uh, I'm going to finish the formal part of today's uh, webinar. Uh, and I'm hoping that at this point, either I could hear from you some of the questions you might have um, about my experiences or, or my, my, what I've talked about today, um, or um, I could hear from you about what types of things you're currently doing uh, to reach your own SDGs and what, maybe what type of challenges you're, you're facing.
Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that uh, thought-provoking, interesting, and inspiring presentation. Um, I'm a bit overwhelmed because that was really a mouthful. Uh, but what was the best for me is that you could speak from real experiences and it's not just you can do this or you can do that, it is we did this and this is how uh, it transpired into reality and this is what we learned from it. So thank you very much for making time to speak to us today to this topic. Uh, this is a very important topic in the come out of learning um, strategic plan where our strap line uh, emphasized the word sustainability and you did address the three pillars there which the partners would remember I addressed in the midterm evaluation questionnaire that we sent out about uh, social inclusion, we talked about environmental protection and economic growth. So it speaks to those three pillars. So for the partners, um, it would be very interesting for us if to hear from you how you can relate to what Jennifer was saying. Uh, we all have different environments. It's not the same exactly where she went. But I know some of you uh, work on issues as uh, like the solar um, energy using the solar lanterns in Bangladesh. Uh, about protecting the environment. So if you need to ask any question, now is the time to see how you can further bring the environment into the classroom or take the classroom out into the environment. Thank you, Jennifer. I think there are Thank you. questions. Christina, over to you. So yes, um, I can see there uh, in the chat box. We have lots of positive comments on the presentation, Jennifer. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, does anyone have a specific question? If so, you can write it in the chat box or just turn on your microphone and I will call on you. Sure, so Mustafa has a question, which we can post to everyone. And he's just asking, to what extent does environmental sustainability issues relate to gender? Get started. Great, thank you for the question, Mustafa. Um, so in terms of gender, and, and again, I'm not an expert by any means on this uh, this subject, but certainly in terms of, of uh, a lot of the, we're looking at the ecotourism aspect, um, a lot of the ecotourism opportunities um, do have uh, the potential to specifically um, impact and benefit vulnerable, vulnerable populations such as women. Um, so certainly in terms of because there's that low entry barrier um, for a lot of the ecotourism opportunities, um, certainly it is one that is much you know, more beneficial or more uh, open um, and accessible for uh, women and children. So certainly I think that you know, given some of the suggestions, especially from the UN, um, that it's, it's very, it has the potential to benefit women and children um, in, in many ways. Perfect, great, thanks so much for the response. Uh, anyone else have a question? You can either write it in the chat box or just turn your microphone on and I'll call on you. Sure, so Sabine, um, I see your comment. Do you actually just want to maybe speak about it and further explain? So you're saying in our culture it's hard to take girls outside um, and their exposure is a minimum. Um, perhaps you want to explain more, Sabine? Do you want to... Oh, I see your microphone's on, go for it. Uh, thank you so much and it was really a very impressive uh, presentation and uh, a very impressive journey of Jennifer. Um, thank you so much for sh sharing your experience and um, I love the part where you said that I'm, I'm an outdoor, outdoor person. Um, but you know, the, cul the culture we are living here, it's very for the girls especially uh, to go out to, uh, to have an outdoor experience. For instance, uh, um, you know, just to go out um, in a way, uh, some, somewhere pleasant to have some like a forest or um, maybe to see a river and have some experience there. Uh, so it's really very hard for us, like an organization to, or an individual as well, to take them there because of the you know cultural barriers and uh, we have to get some consent, ob obviously, from the parents and community. So how 
in culture like uh, ours how to increase their exposure of nature and um especially for girls some maybe some tips or something like that yeah, that's an excellent question. And again, um, by no means, I, I mean, I've, I've had more to, to say about it, but I, I would say that for me, my my initial thought is, you know, if they're not able to go, then as much as possible, trying to bring it to them um, and to bring it to where they are. And so finding ways to incorporate it into the classroom um, if they can't go out of the classroom. So whether that's bringing somebody in, so maybe uh, whether it be an elder from the community or uh, so for and, and I, I mean, although our challenges are different, oftentimes funding and things like that don't let us take students as much as we would like outside. And so, yeah, one of the ways I, I do it in my own classroom is I bring in elders from our community and have them talk about the history of the area um, and the culture in the area and that kind of thing. So incorporating elders or um, people who have a lot of traditional knowledge in the area um, can oftentimes infuse, um, you know, as much as possible bringing in first-hand experience, uh, experiences, so whether it's photos that are, you know, or videos or that kind of thing that are taken by somebody that the students know, oftentimes will give them a little bit more connection. So rather than just showing them uh, a picture from a textbook or a picture from a website that they don't know who took that, having pictures or stories or that kind of thing of people that they know or, and are familiar with, then they have a little bit more of a buy-in right away because they know that somebody that they, that they know has been to this location and enjoyed this location. So I guess as, as my, my biggest suggestion would be as much as possible, try to bring in um, relevant information into the classroom so that at least they can be exposed in that way. Does that help at all? <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. Yes, those things. Thanks, yes. Um, I think that's a really important point to bring up. Um, Thank you both for your thoughtful discussion on that. I think we have one more question. I think yeah. also on um, one of the things that Jennifer listed was using local resources. So that is another way of dealing with environmental protection. And I think, uh, Sabine, um, that is one of the things that you are doing. So we should look at uh, what are we doing at the moment? Maybe make an assessment. What is it that we already do? Because sometimes we do some of these things, but we do not really uh, realize it because we don't put that tag to it. So to become more aware about these issues, uh, I think it is first of all to make an assessment against this presentation and say, these are the advice coming out of this presentation, but what are we doing already? And then we can take it from there, what can we still do? Yes, there's another question from Mustafa, but before Mustafa's question comes up, Sharice has also something to add to the discussion. And, and I'll jump in, um, uh, Francis, and just mentioned um, before we move to a different topic, you just met, brought up a really excellent point in terms of oftentimes I look at my own practice and I don't think I'm doing anything that special uh, or that out of the, the norm or that. And so oftentimes because we're doing things and living the experience, we don't realize, you know, the that we're actually doing these different, you know, things like, you know, incorporating these environmental, um, you know, stewardship activities into our classes and that kind of thing. And so I think that's very true of everyone that we oftentimes don't realize just how much we're off, you know, doing until we take a step back and really do the reflection piece. Good point. I right, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your wonderful presentation. This is Cherise speaking here. I think there's so much to learn from your practical experiences in the field. What I um, what I am thinking and what I see actually Koyali has also brought up in the discussion about sustainable economic development and local partnerships. I think that is a really, really good point. And that speaks to the train of thought where influencing policy making in terms of environment environmental protection is really important. And we need to look at um, what's happening within our country context and how our policymakers are um, thinking about and considering environmental issues. In the case of um, S in Bangladesh, in their proposal, what they're addressing is the linkage between environmental conservation and how it affects women and girls. So what they found is that the more global warming happens, the more uh, the environment is affected, 
the more women and girls are locked out of educational opportunities because the more that they are isolated. So it, influencing policymaking at the local level and at the national level is also very important. And this is where we can come in and think about how we can advocate for envir environmental protection in our own local context. Yes, excellent, excellent point. Okay, and so Mustafa asked one question, um, which we can maybe make it a bit more broad. So he's asking how can curriculum include the environmental issue? Um, and is that through like offering separate courses or extra assignments? Um, Jennifer, perhaps you can just reflect on your experience with this. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in terms of this, I don't think it has to be a whole separate course. Um, I think sometimes if you're you're trying to make a, a separate course in environmental sustainability, the whole process of creating a new course and that kind of thing can actually be too much and therefore block the, you know, the moving forward with that that topic. So for me, I, I think it's more important to include it in the stuff that we're all we're already doing. Um, and so I think just as assignments or projects as as part of courses that we're currently running. Um, so that when we're we're giving new information to students or we're, we're creating activities rather than creating a sort of a general activity creating activities that are are more real and authentic and embedded with that information so it's sort of woven interwoven into everything we do um, i think for me uh, and the students that i work with i want environmental sustainability and them having an environmental conscience um, to become second nature to become part of everything that they do so that they're not having to think, okay, I'm going to turn my brain on now and think about the environment, and then I'm going to turn it off at the end of this lesson and not think about it. So I want it to become just a, a seamless thing. It, it's incorporated into to each and everything that they do. So for me, um, I, my suggestion and my experience would be to start by incorporating it into to the classes that are already being taught um, so that kids realize that this is not just a something that we look at for 20 minutes and then move on, that this is something that's always a part of everything that we do. Perfect, thanks. That's a really great response as well. Um, I'm just going to know, as it's almost time, we're just going to go through one more question um, and then do a wrap up. Um, and of course, if you have any more, um, we can always put you in touch with the speaker, Jennifer, um, or have these conversations on our community of practice as well to keep the discussion going. So, Koyali, which Sharice kind of messages had asked if you had um, seen any local effective economic development partnerships happening locally to promote sustainable economic development and to what extent women were involved. So um, I think we can kind of open that up for anyone if you know of any examples. I'll start off by saying, uh, in terms of my time in Costa Rica, is probably where I've seen this um, the best uh, in terms of uh, local sort of development. Um, as I mentioned, Costa or Monteverde is a, a town of about 6,000 people, um, and it, the number one source of income in that town is uh, is tourism. Uh, that's the the driver in that particular town, and so certainly for that town. Um, you know that has led to the creation of a number of different reserves in town so there's the the monteverde cloud forest reserve is probably the most famous one and the most popular one um, but there certainly is a, a number of different reserves um, that cover large tracts of land um, and that really it's, it's quite controlled in terms of uh, any development and that kind of thing um, and so certainly in terms of the local economy they're only able to do that because of the fact that um, the, the tourism dollar comes in and, and supports that that industry there uh, to the point where they've actually um, they have not paved the roads to Monteverde up, up until this point uh, because they wanted to stop any large corporation development happening in that town. Um, they wanted to make sure that the big box hotels and things like that didn't develop there um, and that it was more kept at a, a local level and that it was the local people that were running hotels and hostels and the, the park and, and that kind of thing. So for them that was a conscious choice made by the community um, and certainly in terms of the extent that in terms of women involved obviously it's allowed a lot of uh, you know a, a number of friends I have there um, it's the women who are running the hostels or the hotels um, there's a number of, of female um, guides in the park um, so there'll be you know interpretive guides for tourists that come into the area that kind of thing so certainly in that particular community um, ecotourism has very much been a part of the economic growth of the community, uh, but also preservation of the local environment. Perfect, great. Thanks so much for that really detailed example. Um, and I think this is a question we can 
I continue discussing on our community of practice because it can often be context specific and I'm sure we have lots of exposure in our own um, careers and lives to this. So this is useful for fun. So I'm going to pass it to Francis for the sake of time to do any concluding comments. Thank you very much, Christina. And uh, first of all, thank you so much to the audience, everybody who signed in today for the session, uh, because we wouldn't have had a session if we didn't have participants. Uh, we have um, some old heads and we have some new heads. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want to give a special word of thanks to Jennifer for making time and uh, preparing and then speaking to this topic so passionately, but also inspiring us to really have a look at what we are doing and uh, try to do more. Uh, my takeaways from this is uh, based on also the questions that came up that for us to take a step back and uh, look at what we are doing already uh, and to develop uh, a sustainability conscience and you know to think about it last year in January uh, after that was 2017 in January after all my business left uh, our house was full of boxes for Christmas presents and stuff and I had to take it to uh, the deep depot for dropping it off and that day uh, it dawned on me that I'm not doing enough to protect the environment and so, since that day I had a conscious movement in my house for recycling so we still have a far way to go but families, as Jennifer has said, is where most of uh, our um, ideas start. It's mostly where we are defined uh, by what we are doing or not. So that is one thing. And then to take it then a step forward and say, okay, we are doing this. What more can we do? And that links with Mustafa's question, which was uh, eloquently responded to by Jennifer. Uh, and I totally agree, before you answer, I actually said this is one that I would suggest, and that is to mainstream uh, the whole environment sustainability agenda in whatever we teach and not to have it as an add-on, because in that case it can sometimes be, you know, it's just a, an afterthought. But if we mainstream it, meaning that in everything we do, we bring it into the discussion, in that way, we will inculcate that conscience of we have to be sensitive about how we protect our environment. And I want to conclude by saying uh, Mustafa's question also uh, provoked the other issue when he said how it relates to gender. Uh, because last year when we had one of our observance days for girls and women, there was one where we talked about how Child marriage is basically, um, or girls are at risk of child marriage because of disasters, because of natural disasters. So if a family in an area where there's floods, etc., they lose their house and everything, and there's a young girl, uh, the family will look out for where is their rich husband that can take care of us, and we say, okay, we marry off our daughter. So there is a direct link linked to the work that we are doing on sustainability or environmental protection. So girls are at risk specifically in natural disaster areas. That is what research also showed us about child marriage. So there is, this is a very, very important topic uh, for the work that we are doing uh, and partners are doing a lot already. Uh, so let's vote on that and let's go back to this webinar and, and, and replay it with our the rest of our teams in our organization and let's have more discussions uh, within our organization about what more we can do so thank you very much also to christina who made all the arrangements and patiently contacted everybody um, and made follow follow up and really facilitated the session and then to all of you thank you so much and all the best uh, and we will See you at our next webinar. Thank you also, Cherise, for your support and input to the session. Bye, everybody.